everyone and welcome to the Motorsport Podcast. I'm Ed Foster and we've got a very special recording for you today because I'm joined by Martin Brundle, obviously a Le Mans 24 Hours winner, a world sports car champion, a Formula One driver over many, many years for many, many teams and now a Motorsport Hall of Fame inductee. Martin Brundle, a very warm welcome and congratulations on the Editor's Choice Award. I know I'm really made up. I've been to obviously lots of these awards and when you indict people into, induct people into the <laughs> Hall of Fame. And, uh, and uh, I might have been right first, I don't know. Uh, and yeah, I, it never occurred to me, I might be lucky enough and privileged enough one day to, uh, to be uh, recognized in this way. So I'm um, thoroughly pleased. Yeah, because there's obviously in the Motorsport Hall of Fame, there's there's the likes of Enzo Ferrari, Sir Sterling Moss, uh, drivers, team owners. Uh, but there is also Murray Walker, uh, purely for sort of what he did for motorsport. Um, and I think it's, it's fair to say, I know you will sort of, uh, you will shudder when I say this, but it's, I think it's fair to say that you are mentioned in, in the same breath as Murray Walker nowadays, you know, with all that you've done for commentating and, and bringing it to the masses. Well, that's very kind of you to say so. I mean, there will only ever be one Murray Walker who I've uh, spoken to a few times recently and is in um, is very sharp of mind, as you might expect, and fully up to speed of what's going on in Formula One. But uh, no, I don't. I don't think. I don't think that'd be right. Murray, you know, was on TV for what, over fifty years and and was just revered around around the world. Uh, I've been very lucky. I had a couple of careers in Formula One, and it does seem, and it hurts me to say it, but it does seem that my uh, driving career was a fact-finding mission for my media career. But who's complaining? I'm certainly not, because I've just been, I've just been really lucky. Um, and uh, I would say, yeah, you make me feel slightly guilty when you're listing all the people in already in the Hall of Fame. Uh, but... You know, it were, I, I had a few years working alongside Murray when I first went to the commentary box, which, you know, to learn from him was something uh, very special indeed. And, um, you know, it, to be shown the ropes and, and probably the smartest decision I've ever made in any career, any job I've ever had was I decided to stand up uh, uh, and if it was good enough for Murray Walker, it's good enough for me. And he always says, you can, you know, your lungs are more open and your chest is open and, um and so that's what I did. And I think we got a rapport straight away uh, in terms of, you know, sharing, sharing the two mics we had then and telling the story. So I've, I've just been so lucky all the way through. I'll, 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 we'll talk about Murray a little bit more in a, in a second. But I remember, I remember you saying that you feel as though your, kind of your Formula One or motorsport career as a driver was preparation for, you know, for the, the career that you have now. And I mentioned that to Karun the other day because obviously he's very much moved into a sort of similar role and all he said was well it was a bloody way bloody expensive way of preparing for it <laughs> 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 um it's yeah, yeah it's, it's um a Karun has the same kind of insight as you and i do see similarities between you both yeah i work with Karun at, at sky now he's got an encyclopedic knowledge of motorsport and formula one in particular more, more so than than i have or in fact anybody i know um has so i think you know Motorsport's all about tomorrow, isn't it? It's all about the next pole position, the next fastest lap, the victory, the championship, um, or, or, or whatever. And of course, we love to look back. And I love reading Motorsport magazine because you, you you cover, you know, modern stuff and uh, and all the way through the decades. So there's a, a bit of everything in there. And so we have to remember the pioneers and the the, you know, all the wonderful characters that made our sport so global, so um, exciting and, and the people who gave their lives for it uh, or, or their good health or, or whatever. So, you know, I don't belittle what I achieved in behind the wheel. I'm very satisfied, actually, with, you know, the, the various sports car races I was lucky enough to be part of the winning team for, or, you know, the Formula One, I had a, a 10 years, I think, in 12 as a Formula One driver. And it's really hard to get to Formula One and much harder to stay there. So, you know, I had some great races. I came through, started banger racing four miles from where I am right now in West Norfolk and some hot rods and just got lucky on the way through and wrote to the right people, met the right people, delivered when I had the chances. So I, I don't belittle that, but I always think, you know, for example, 
uh, on Sky. I think we go out to 80 territories around the world, English speaking territories. And, um, you know, those people uh, don't know, half of them don't know. I used to race, the other half don't care. It's all about what's going to happen now. They want just to be informed. And, and touching on Murray, and you said you can touch on it later, but I had dinner with him on the first night uh, before I joined F1 ITV. Uh, I didn't want to be a commentator. I wanted to be a Formula 1 driver, and I thought I was driving for Jordan that year, and I was, uh, and so I was a bit grumpy and reluctant, if I'm honest. And I said, come on, Murray, t- tell me something I need to know. You know, uh, this broadcaster, you've been in it forever. And he was like, I can't tell you anything about Formula 1, Martin. You know, and uh, I said, come on. He said, I'll, I'll just tell you one thing. Um, and I've remembered this to this day, and I apply it to this day. Just remember, we are simply here to inform and, en- and entertain nothing more and he's absolutely right so you've got to it's not about you you've got to leave your ego out of the commentary box uh, occasionally you can use your experience to explain something and people will trust you because they know you've been there and almost anything i see people you know incidents or accidents or wh- whatever i've kind of experienced it one way or another so um, you you do use your experience a bit in broadcasting but fundamentally it's just explaining things to people. So they end up, you know, they've given up two or three hours of their Sunday afternoon uh, or five hours if they're watching the entire Sky output to enjoy a sport they love in Formula One. And they just want to know more. And, and, and that's, you know, Mary taught me that. Yeah. Because you, your sort of, your break, I suppose, came when it was at the Belgian Grand Prix at Spa when James Hunt was MIA after a particularly yeah. big night. And I think you'd, your Brabham had you'd retired from the race and someone said, well, why don't you go and stand next to, to, to Murray? What, that was obviously, you know, it wasn't planned at all, but how much did Murray help you in that sort of first, that first instance and then afterwards? Because you mentioned him giving you a bit of advice, but was he, quite, was he sort of a, a tutor, as you like, or would, did he let you get on with it? Possibly not on that day in history because I was a, you know, a, a Formula One driver who's literally just dropped out of a race and uh, my adrenaline still fading away and, and the disappointment grows at the same rate. And Mark Wilkin of BBC at the time was looking for any driver that dropped out of the race that could speak English and go in with Murray because you say James Hunt was missing in action. So, um, and I do remember my manager at the time afterwards saying, why didn't you stay in there longer? It was going so well. You should have stayed. Um, but I was thinking about getting the hell out of there before the traffic, the spa traffic hit. Uh, but then I had another chance to commentate in 95 when I had a, um, yeah, I had a half a, Lig- yeah. Yeah, half a Ligier drive, didn't I? And um, so on the races where I wasn't driving, um, I would, I was still working for Ligier, but then I, I think on the Saturday I'd be in the Eurosport commentary box and on the Sunday, the BBC commentary box. So that's where I perhaps first learned to work with Murray a little bit and, and understand television. So that perhaps ended my Formula One career early because it, at the end of 96, it was like Brundle stopping Formula One driving. He's going to become a commentator on F1 ITV. And um, it kind of turned into the truth. Mm. It's it's interesting, isn't it, how sort of life works out because you never quite know what's around the corner. But the, you know, Murray was very, um, he was well known for his Murrayisms, uh, which I'm sure anyone listening or watching will kind of reel 10 just off the top of their head, of, of their heads. Um, but you, I mean, you're sort of developing quite a few yourself that are, the, that are Brundleisms. They're not Murrayisms, but they're, you know, um, hugging the apex, apex like your favourite granny and, and bits and pieces like that. And it's, it, it must be quite satisfying because it is a, I suppose it's a sign that the public, it's a, it's a sign of endearment from the public, isn't it? Um, in this world of social media and kind of um, sort of hatred, as it were. Uh, it's it's <laughs> nice to have that. <laughs> yeah, it, it is lovely when people come up to you and say how much pleasure you've given them over the years, well, when they used to be allowed to come up to you um, and approach you in an airport or, a, you know, on the underground in London or something. But um, I don't know, let's hope we get back to those days. But, yeah, it, it, the reason I do that is because humor is a great way of communicating um, and one-liners. People remember one-liners, and if they're pertinent and relevant to what's going on on the track, they'll talk about it. They'll, they'll, uh, occasionally, I get them 
re- replayed back to me. And obviously they, they, some Chinese whispers, they end up being different to the words you use, but, uh, and, and meaning quite something else, but it, it is. And I, I've also noticed that people have very different sense of humors, of course, and they remember completely different things. Um, but it, it is, you've got to get information over in bite sized pieces, little shiny magpie pieces that people want to grab and take away with them. Because if you do a three minute monologue on, uh, you know, how Pirelli tires work or don't and the meaning of life, it just goes over people's heads and just turn off to it. You've got it. You've got to give them the information in, in bite sized bits. Yeah. Now, obviously one of the large sort of things you're known for is the grid walk, um, which I think kind of, it, it wasn't a hugely planned thing. It, it just sort of develop, it developed. Um, I, I think you said it make, makes it used to make you nervous. Does it still make you nervous, that section? Yeah, it does. It's the only thing really that gives me, you know, so the live television excites me. So I always think it's about 30% as exciting to be on the grid, you know, with, with live television as it is with uh, being a driver. And, you know, often we've got two or three people talking in our ears while we're, while we're, while I'm doing the grid, um, somebody giving me a hard countdown, a, a producer, and then somebody else saying, and they've seen, you know, Charlie Hummingtop up the front, you know, go and talk to them. Um, and then I've got to find my next victim. I've got to think of a question. I've got to listen to the answer because that's the biggest crime. If they say something really big and you, you didn't even, you weren't even listening and work out where I'm going to go next. So I like that challenge and it makes me nervous because it's eight, nine minutes of live television, unscripted, unrehearsed and just go, you know, everybody in my team just sits back and waits for me to look a complete idiot in front of millions of people around the world, which I frequently do. So it does make me nervous, but mostly because I, it's my alter ego. I do not recognize that person who interrupts, you know, three world champions having a conversation together, enjoying the grid. And I go barging in and, and interrupt it or some, movie star who doesn't want to talk to me or some footballer who turns out only speaks Spanish or something like that. But <laughs> I, I've had some classically good moments on the grid and some classically, classically bad ones, but uh, I've never watched one. I hate, I couldn't bear to watch it on the telly anyway, but uh, I've, I'm going to be, I've never said this uh, so far through this pandemic, but I'm really pleased. I don't have to do them at the moment. Really pleased. But, but equally I'll be really pleased when I'm allowed to do it again. Yeah, it's uh, talking about not w- watching yourself back. I mean, there's a Jensen and DC story about sort of making you watch a, a Grand Prix back, which I might just oh, yeah. in a second. But there's one of the wonderful lines I found. Um, of, I think this must be you on a grid walk. And you said there's a story that Justin Bieber might be on the grid. So obviously we've got to avoid him if we get half a chance. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's something I found online. So I'm not 100% sure whether that's true or not. But if it is, it's wonderful. Um. Yeah, it's, I get cheeky, don't I? I get really, really cheeky. Um, and I think there is that, it is that silence I need, I need to fill. Um, if, you just, if you just practice talking for nine minutes with not knowing anything in particular that's going to happen next, it's quite a long time. So, um, yeah, and nonsense comes out of my head. Um, I did have an evening where I drove DC back to Monaco. I was his manager and Jensen just picked up his new Porsche Carrera thing. And we charged from Monza to Monaco through the tunnels. It was fantastic. I think DC, I was driving DC's 500E Mercedes um, or something like that, or AMG thing. And uh, Jensen followed, peppered the front of his car, actually, followed me so closely all the way home. And it was brilliant. And then all the pair of them wanted to do was sit and watch the replay of the race, of which I was commentating on. We sat on DC's boat in the harbour in Monaco. And I was dying a thousand deaths because I'm thinking, what, A, what have I said about my client? <laughs> because I tend to, I always tell it the way I see it because I'm not bright enough to do anything else. And what have I said about Jensen today? It was, it was awful <laughs> not to be Is repeated. It, I think you, didn't you say that it's, commentating was one of the things you had to work least hard at? Yeah. Yeah, and my and son. I think my son's finding the same. Alex is doing some commentary on F one, F two, and F three at the moment, and finds it finds it the same way. Yeah, yeah. I, I think for me, it's because I was a car, I'm a car dealer, so I'm used to engaging people and talking to people. You know, trying to second guess are they're going to buy a car or not. I guess. Yeah. Um, 
No, I di- I've never taken a no into a commentary box in 25 years. Um, we have stat packs and all that, which are massively helpful. Um, you've just got to say say what you see. Sounds like, uh, what's that TV program catchphrase? Yeah. But no, you, you've got to... I'm just the eyes and ears of, of the... Um, my job is really simple. I've got to put the fans on the grid, pre-race, in the cockpit, during the race and and on the pit wall because that's my knowledge base so that it it's really quite simple and i don't need notes to do that or um i don't need to practice that really um somebody will come along and blow me out of the water soon uh in terms of their knowledge and their work rate and what they're prepared to do to make make form one television but um and when it does i'll do something out when they you know I, i'm surprised it hasn't happened already to be honest so um I'm just looking at a new deal now. So, yeah, um, you know, uh, in a way, I mean, I haven't started a Grand Prix since 1996, but I, I get away with that as long as I'm still really up to date. I've driven 56 Formula One cars now, different ones, and and included three of the latest hybrids. So as long as I stay up to date, um, which is really hard to do in this electronic age, I must say, because, you know, if a driver runs wide in a corner, was it his brake by wire that didn't function properly? Was it, you know, any other part of his electronics or maybe the, you know, um, maybe the way the engine's reacting on lift off uh, 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 and uh, all the things they do, or did the driver just screw up? And it's really hard because there's so much going on. And then you see them on the steering wheel, don't you? With I think the last time I drove one of these cars, I counted well over 40 controls in the cockpit, some of which had, or several of which had sub menus. So um, it's really quite hard these days to know exactly what's going on with the driver uh, and his engine modes and, and whatever. But in, in the end, you just got to, you know, it's live. You've got to call it the way you see it. And if you make a mistake, you've got to, you've got to say so. Yeah. Um, we've got a lot of, a lot of readers questions. Um, and just talking about the Formula One cars you've driven, there's one here from, Ed Moses, who's asking that your top five F1 cars um, from the huge variety that you've driven over the years and, and why them? Um, I'm guessing that the Mercedes, I seem to remember you sort of waxing lyrical about the Mercedes, the, the most recent one you've driven, because it was, it was by far, it, even in the wet, it had more grip than your Tyrrell had when you first came into yeah. the world. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it was incredible. And I'm, I'm sure they gave me, you know, TV commentators power and nothing like the real thing, but it was raining torrentially and i'd been i'd been warned so many times that the team needed that car for some work the next day and like crashing it was not was not an option but i was splashing through woodcoat thinking it'd be so easy to smash the thing to pieces but um that was great that was a great car um cars that really stand out for me fangio streamliner and um that that was all. I drove that with Lewis at Silverstone a year or two back. Um, Lewis's two thousand eight McLaren, the one that was like an aero channel, basically that just stuck to the road like nothing I've ever driven before at that point. Um, Senna's MP four four I drove in in Sao Paulo in Interlagos uh, last year in his hometown. That was pretty damn special. Um, the Gurney Eagle, surely the most beautiful racing car uh, of all time i drove at goodwood and it just goes on yock and rinse lotus 72 i drove this year um that that was just anything with a dfv engine in it i love because it's so tractable it's so easy and lovely and just to drive and you know when you're moving when you when your foot's connected to the engine with a cable and your hands connected to the gearbox with a rod and you you're strapped into the chassis you you feel like it's like an, an analog experience instead of a digital experience that the modern cars have where you're, you know, you're not controlling the throttle. Like you, you're controlling a potentiometer that's got a, a million things going on behind you. So um, some, of the, some of the older ones, um, Gethin's BRM, I drove around Monza. I think I've run out of my five already, haven't I? But I could, I could <laughs> go on forever, go on forever, to be honest, because they're just such beautiful cars. Yeah. Um- the, behind you is a model of the TWR IMSA Jaguar, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Is, it, is it the XJR 10, yep. 11? I always get confused which is which because one uh, is IMSA, one. 
I think the 11 uh, was IMSA and then the 10 was, was World Sports Car Championship. Anyway, that doesn't matter. Not um, a clue. Not a clue. I did, <laughs> n- numbers of cars are yeah, never interested me. I, or any other driver, I'd imagine. Yeah. Uh, um, but uh, it, that's, the, that's the Daytona winning, winning car. Yeah. 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 Like and, then, and then a Villeneuve 312, Gilles Villeneuve 312 underneath. Yep. Because the TWR was, you know, you drove for him for decades. And really that was, if you're thinking of people that played a large part in your career, um, Tom Walkinshaw was enormous because you wrote him a letter saying, I think I'll be quite good. Put me in your county championship car, please, for Norfolk. And, I did. And then decades later, you were winning Le Mans for him and, and winning the World Sports Car yeah. Championship and Daytona 24 hours. I mean, is he, surely he must be one of the most kind of pivotal people in your career. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah, after my mum and dad tolerated me spending company money we didn't have on, you know, stock hot rods and Formula Ford 2000s and British Touring Car Championship Toyota Celicas and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, Tom was like a second father to me. So I wrote to him in 1979, asking him to put me in the, the BMW County Championship. He did. And I, and I put me on, on the international scene overnight, really racing against lots of very famous racing drivers. So... Um, and then I eventually finished working with Tom in 1997 um, when I was at Arrows with him and, uh, and that. And well, sadly, we lost Tom, of course, but he was, he was absolutely brilliant to me. And he took me, you know, on the journey with the Works Audi team with Sir Sterling in 81 through Jaguar touring cars, European touring cars. Uh, through all the sports car racing. He took me with him to Benetton in 92, to Ligier in 95. And then when I stopped racing, we were doing a few things together. He was, um, he never let me down. Uh, I know Tom's not uh, entirely popular everywhere, but he never, ever let me down. He actually owed me some money from 97. Didn't you owe him some money? He, 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 oh yeah, I still I never played him the ten grand bag. He, <laughs> yeah. he he um he lent me and Eddie Jordan to try and stay stay racing against it and Senna in in eighty three. Tom Tom was first in with some a chunk of change a loan. Yeah, he never got back, but uh, he did owe me a, he owed me some money at the end of ninety seven, and then came up to me one day early ninety nine and handed me an envelope. Um that uh, had a check in it he had a, almost had a tear in his eye actually he said i'm sorry it's taken so long and the check was the money owed me plus interest plus vat so never really? never ever let me down and i loved having tom on my pit wall because he he had a racer's racer's eye as to how the thing was unfolding yeah he's i mean he had quite a fearsome reputation because i think is it eddie hinckley who was the first twr employee and there's a quote yeah. from him saying, you know, Tom was great, but we always used to joke that we should keep him in a cage, wheel it up to the car, put him in the car, and then wheel the cage, and then put it back in the cage when he came out. Because in the car, he was amazing, but outside of it, he was a complete nightmare. <laughs> um, but obviously, um, he respected drivers being a driver, I guess. He had to stand up to Tom. It would be a pretty strong cage, and he'd keep him in, by the way. Um, he had to stand up to Tom. And I think that's why I got on fine with him. I was, yeah, when things weren't right, I would, I would tell him so. Yeah. You mentioned Sterling Moss there, um, who you shared, a, you know, who you, you, was your teammate, British Touring Car Championship in 81. We lost Sterling this year and there was, uh, you know, a tribute to him at Goodwood. But um, what's, what an amazing man. Um, just sort of hear your thoughts on him because really he was, he was the pinnacle of British motorsport, wasn't he, for, for decades? Yeah, I mean, it was so sad that Lady Susie didn't wasn't able to make the the parade at Goodwood Speed Week this year. Um, it's really sad. I mean, I think we lost Sterling a while back, didn't we? Uh, effectively, um, and it, 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 you know, he's now got gone for good. Ah, why do we have to lose wonderful people like him? Isn't it? It's, uh, life's just cruel like that, but. Um, he achieved so much and he was so strong, wasn't he? Coming back from his accident in 62, coming back from falling down the lift shaft at home when he was in his seventies and, and, uh, what a, what a class act Sterling was, uh, in and out of the car and his legend will grow. 
And, uh, you know, what he achieved. And when you see him jump out of the car in Monaco, we drove those three cars on Sky this year when Jensen was in the Lotus. But you see him jump out of the car in Monaco, his face all covered in oil. Like he pulls up. It's just been the longest, longest races they used to do. It must be so physical and so hot. And he jumps out of the car and thanks everybody because there were no seat belts and no crash protection and really no fireproof gear and helmets were cursory, weren't they? In in, in many respects, to what they were going to achieve. So, um, ju- just you know, he survived that period of time and he how brave they were the pioneers. Um, that forged the way for us. We just can't ever thank them enough. But uh, as I said, the, you know, that's what it's all about tomorrow, isn't it? But we must never forget uh, those days. Yeah. In, in the Sterling Moss Memorial Trophy this year was, um, well, Alex, your son, who was doing things with uh, an E-type that really I've, I haven't seen for a very long time. He's really taken to, to the classics, hasn't he? Yeah, he has. Alex is flying along in those. So it's his first year in that, but he's, he's teamed up with Gary Pearson, who's a wonderful mentor for him. And yeah, he's taken to those cars uh, and the way he drifts them about. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we talked about it. It's, uh, you know, it's a club you need to go and join and join with respect and bide your time and don't damage the cars and, and just generally but he pushes it along. People always want you in those cars. Can you go fast in them? And you've got to respect the machinery you're in, the gearboxes, the clutches and, and brakes and all that sort of thing. So uh, I'm very impressed with the way he's, he's taken to it. He won a lovely race. I saw at Brands Hatch in a Lola T70. And I am insanely jealous, to be honest. I stood at Goodwood, <laughs> jealous as hell of my son, um, <laughs> which, which is... A curse, really. I'm 61 years old and can't lose that feeling at all. But it's actually motivated me to do do more racing next year. Yeah, yeah. Because I think he was he was sharing a mini with Nick Swift, who's kind of you know yeah. the the quick guy in a mini. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And he went he went to a test day and went out and did a 135 lap or something. Came and said, right, you know, yeah. that was pretty good. What what lap times are you doing? And Nick said, yeah. well, the fastest one I've ever done is a late 132. And Alex sort of looks yeah. at me, blimey. But sure enough, at Speed Week, he was doing 132s. You know, it's, um, yeah. he's, he's, it's, yeah. it's rare you get someone with as much success who's humble enough to listen, you know, just to someone like yeah. or Gary. Or, so, you know, he's obviously he's going about it the right way. Yeah, he's matured nicely. I, quite why Alex has never been picked up by a works sports car team I, I, is one of the great mysteries to be of, uh, of motorsport because he is stunning in in the latest sports cars i was barely ever like me barely ever scratched one put him in the car and he'll bring it back in, in every bit as good a condition as he got it and three three four stints later so uh, it's a mystery to me because i think he's he's a world world-class driver in sports car racing but he's t- you know if you can jump in a, a, a mini for the first time and an e-type and a t70 and and, and a d-type and make them all talk uh, then you're, you've got some skills. But I, I, I race everything. I did the Truck Grand Prix at Donington. I did touring cars, sports cars. I did the Rally Great Britain a couple of times. And I rock in America. I've done, yeah, it, it's perhaps that's our skill. That's our, be, our best skill. Maybe, you know, um, I wasn't as quick as Schumacher and Senna and there's one or two sports car drivers. Alex is not as outright quick as. But then... And when you play the longer game, it sort of seems to work out. Yeah. Um, there's obviously, you know, we are fresh off the back of Lewis Hamilton's seventh world championship. Um, and there's, there's a lot of talk of the greatest, all ta- greatest of all time. And I feel as though it's a sort of slightly thankless question to pose because ultimately uh, there's various people who just hate what you say. But I just wanted to get your thoughts on where Hamilton is because it's not all, it's not all about the car. Um, he is truly, I think, one of the greatest, greatest British sports people of all time. Um, and uh, he truly is quite astonishing what he's achieved. But I just want to sort of hear what, what you thought. Well, I feel it's been an absolute privilege to witness firsthand. And when I stood in Park Ferme, ready to interview him after the race at the weekend in Istanbul, as we as the last race uh, as we're filming this, um, I, 
I had butterflies in my stomach. I said, this is just the most... I went and walked towards his car. I wanted to see his tires that he'd finished the race what was on. Left of them? <laughs> what was left of them. And, you know, he lapped his teammate during that race with, with one hand gesticulating, what are you doing? We've been past so many blue flags on a wet turn two in Istanbul Park, um, you, driving one-handed, somehow finding grip that nobody else could find like Senna used to. So um, I think in a way you're married to whoever you think or, or have always thought was the greatest of all time. And it tends to be somebody from your own era. So I keep challenging myself on this, but you cannot have a discussion about greatest of all time without including Lewis Hamilton in it. And I agree with you. He's one of the greatest sports men of all time. He's certainly one of the greatest British sportsmen and, and folk of all time. So um, what, what can you do? You know, and he's, no, he's nowhere near finished yet. So uh, yeah, I have to keep an open mind on that. You know, I've always, like Seb Vettel is married to the idea that Michael will always be the greatest. I am with Ayrton, for example, but... And you have, you have to keep an open mind and you can't deny what Lewis has achieved and the way he's achieved it. He's a clean driver. He's fast. He's, he ticks all the boxes in terms of what you'd want out of a racing driver. And, and he's, you know, he's 35, but he doesn't act like a 35. You don't see him fading in any way with his fitness or his racecraft or his bravery or his eyesight or nothing seems to be fading. It just seems to be getting, uh, you know, better with experience. So uh, it's just, we're witnessing something very special. Yeah. So, you know, you raced against Ayrton famously in, in Formula in that Formula 3 championship uh, that, that season. You, you were Michael Schumacher's teammate. You know, you've been, you know, up and up close with two of the other sort of greatest of all time uh, drivers. Are there big differences and similarities you see across those three? Um, yeah, and you've got to remember I raced with Sterling another year in, in the touring cars, yeah. not in nine single seaters, but you know, and, and against Alan and Nigel and Keki and all of those amazing champions, uh, and Nikki uh, and people like that. I mean, I stood on the bank at Paddock Hill Bend and Cops watching Sir Jackie and Graham and, and Jim and all that. I, I, I would love to have raced in that period of time I must say but um, Ayrton and Michael completely different characters Ayrton driven by from the heart and Michael driven from the head and um, you know both unbelievably great racing drivers for completely different reasons I think I mean, Ayrton always felt the world was against him somehow but he had a God-given talent for where the grip was um, somehow before and during the corner rather than during and after it like the rest of us. And Michael just applied himself. He just worked hard and just got all everything pointing in his direction. Uh, it did to an extent, uh, just as Nicky and Alan did. But you know, I think I, I'm not sure Michael was just quite as naturally talented as Ayrton, but uh, he, he made up for it and, and, and actually improved on it in, in many other respects. So, um, Lewis is a bit of a combination of, of all of those so uh, I, I'm open minded on it um, I do I think for me it's for people to make their own minds up it's not for me to inform their opinion I can just say what I've experienced first hand against it in, in F1 and I raced against it for sort of 11, over an 11 year period and with Michael for many years and then as teammates and I raced against Michael in sports cars as well but what you see you can only explain what you see and what you feel. It's not, not for me to tell anybody else what they think about who's greatest of all time. Yeah. Uh, very diplomatic um, answer, Martin. And one which... Well, that's the way I feel about lots, it. Yeah, lots of hatred on social media for, which many people are. Um, uh, yeah, got, I don't, you've got, you, don't, you mustn't read the social media stuff. <laughs> no. um, we've got a lot of readers' questions. So I, I should ask some of these. I'll just, I'll, these will all kind of come out a bit randomly. Um, but we've got one uh, here from Kevin um, asking what the most satisfying single lap you've ever done, whether that's a race or a quali lap. Um, so what jumps into my mind, my pole position lap for Toyota at Le Mans in 1999 was pretty satisfying. Um, 
I tended to have races I really loved rather than laps. Qualifying wasn't my, I was on pole lots and sports cars and that, but um, qualifying was never my forte. It was, um, it was the races. So passing Michael in 1992 in Canada, I was about to win my first Grand Prix until I was catching gear hard, hand over fist, and it damaged his engine until my differential broke, uh, unusually for the Benetton that year, which would have transformed my my Formula One career actually that that day. But some bolt in my diff of the of the Benetton, but um, and Michael Michael did apologise to me for holding me up in a lot of those races. Uh, a year or so later, he wanted to have dinner, and he was like. I really, now I understand it more now, you know, faster teammates, this and that, and how stupid it was of me to hold you up in 92. Cause I tended to have certainly in the first part of the year, a better race car than him. Cause I had a lot more experience than him. So I always appreciated him taking the trouble to say that. Um, yeah. Great, great laps. No, I think a great race is more than great laps. Yeah. Um, there's one here from, uh, noble F1. Um, I'm, pretty sure that's not his real name or her real name uh you can make three changes to formula one what would they be and why well that's about an hour isn't it uh, i was we gonna need say to that's, quite, that's quite a large question uh, what would i do the cars have to become lighter um and what i'm hoping 2022 will be is slash the downforce slash the weight make the cars more nimble and more simple uh, to understand we can still be relevant don't laden we we need to be eco we need to be on message we need to contribute to where the world needs to go to in form one we can do that always has done but don't laden the f1 car with everything um because at the end of the day we're entertainment um i would have a some a little way into the season on three or four tracks uh reverse championship position grid qualifying race because i think the same same guys would still end up same people would still end up winning the world championship would extend it a bit and what give us a must watch race with uh cars coming through the pack and give the minnows um some oxygen at the front of the pack for a while um what else would i do get a few more of the classic tracks in i think and uh get a tire that's a bit more raceable something so, something i mean to, to, for most of what's all about tires always has been but you've got to get the ratio right yeah there's a well there's a question so, here actually from from dan purdy about what tracks you would like to see that are the, you know permanently on the f1 calendar i'm guessing that's that's the classics it's the monza it's the spa yeah monza spa silverstone suzuka um, they have to remain. They've got the history, the heritage. I do like with my TV cap on a new race every year to talk to go to because it, it generates something fresh. And, and we've seen that this year, haven't we? I mean, I think it's energized this bizarre championship we're having at the moment. That's worked incredibly well, but going back to Imola, back to Nürburgring, you know, going to Portimao for the first time. So don't mind a bit of a new track. Bit, uh, uh, even if they've been quite old school in some respect but it does definitely add to you need something fresh every year in, in Formula 1 I think um, some, a fresh venue because they go they really go for it and they, you, it's got to be a combo street circuits new historic you know classic um, high speed uh, we, we, we need a smorgasbord of tracks yeah the word of the day word of the day that is, that, that is a good one. Um, I, uh, you, you know, talking about the Formula One regulations there, you know, Ross Braun obviously is, has been very instrumental in, in, you know, where we go next as a sport. Um, do you have sort of complete faith in, in what he's managing to do? I'm not saying faith in Ross Braun, so I think sort of everyone has that in terms of what he can manage, but the setup of Formula One is so political and difficult. It's very hard for one person and a team of people to say, right, this is what we're doing. So do you have faith in kind of where we're going? Largely, yeah. I think we, uh, you, you, you can't ha just have engineers deciding where the sport needs to go because they're, they think differently. They think in zeros and ones, and uh, sometimes it needs a bit, something a bit more flamboyant than that. But 
it's a difficult line to walk along because you've got to please original equipment manufacturers, you've got to please sponsors, you've got to please countries that you go to and the teams, the teams have got to be viable and, and, and be able to, you know, stay in business. So, and you want some continuity as well. It's a very difficult line to, to walk along, but I think you've got to make sure what the goals are. And the goals for me are slightly terrifying, um, edgy, unbelievably fast Formula One cars and cars that, and we saw it in Istanbul. I want to see a driver driving a car. I don't want to, I don't have to wait and see a, a sky comparison on, uh, you know, where at the sky pad where we're looking for a 20 you know a 20 degree turn of the steering wheel is the difference between why hamilton or bottas was on pole or not you know because that's not that doesn't excite me i want i want to see drivers really driving the cars and and i want to hero worship them for that which we do get on very wet days wet qualifying sometimes or or like Istanbul, and the, another driver's moan because they love a car that they can just put the nose into a corner at 200 miles an hour flat out and it sticks and it will always stick. Um, I want to see them working harder than that. It's interesting, isn't it? Because after you know, they all went out onto the circuit the first time with the new surfaces, Istanbul, everyone was, you know, especially Lewis Hamilton was complaining. But, you know, there he was a couple of days later winning the Grand Prix by half a minute. Um, you know, they do, Formula One drivers, you have a tendency to work around problems. Well, you do, but obviously if the track's wet, then that's the sort of grip they had. I mean, they probably had as much grip sometimes in the wet as they did in on slicks in Istanbul on, on the Friday. But, it's all, you know, they've all got the same amount of grip. So, yeah, all right. So you have to keep driving the car right through to and even past the exit of the corner. That's how it used to be. Just watch Jim Clark and people like that. You know, um, it's no good once you've got you know once you break within one and a half meters of accuracy and got the nose in, you can floor the throttle. That who's interested in that? I understand why the drivers love it. You spend your entire life trying to make your it, countless hundreds of hours in briefings trying to make your racing car perfect. Then you jump in one that's perfect. I understand why a race driver doesn't want to lose that, especially if he, it could cost him a result or make him look silly. Um, but that's that's not what it's that's not what it's about, is it? It's about seeing the heroes and what, watching. I th I thought the drivers all looked heroes in Istanbul, and they're all moaning that it's not really what F one's about. Yeah, I mean, there's that one. Not all, of, not all of them. Yeah, <laughs> there's uh, that wonderful clip of Kafir um, going through the chicane on sort of on opposite lock, both yeah. you know, on both corners is, is wonderful. I, I'll come back to modern F1 because we've we've only got sort of a little bit left um, at the end. I did want to talk to you about rallying. Um, I know yeah. we are jumping sort of all over the place, but you did the RAC rally '96 um, in a in a form two thousand and two thousand yeah. as well. Um, I want to talk to you about it a because I think rally drivers are stunning um and also because uh an escort cosworth is my 70 year old mum's daily driver so i do quite have a <laughs> well done her <laughs> yeah um the uh, i seem to remember you said that well, you crashed inevitably um do you still subscribe to that that it was inevitable that you were going you were going to crash both times yeah yeah because uh, both times i stopped listening to my co-driver um, because you're just not you you're just not used to it and it's uh, for me, rally drivers are the most gifted drivers on the planet because they have to cope with so many unknowns. You, you recce uh, a stage and then between the recce and the rally, there's been logging. So now you've got a, an extremely muddy area lined with logs both sides that didn't even, you know, that was different when you came through there or you recce in the dark and you do it in the in the light or you recce in the rain you do it in the snow and these guys i remember doing a test in wales in 2000 with carlos science and didier Oriol, and we got we got to the end of the day and i was half a second a mile slower than them only and everybody was like wow how'd you do that and i felt completely under control but what it was was what i do uh, or did and that's go run around and up and down the same track and improve we got to the first stage in Wales. It was foggy. 
and raining and muddy. And I was 15 seconds a mile slower than Carlos because that, but they could turn up and do it once flat out. And that's, that's a skill. Uh, And the way Carlos describes how, when his co-driver, you know, read the notes, the track appeared in his mind. And I'm trying to remember because you're getting these three corners in advance. And let's say both times I crashed because I momentarily stopped listening to my co-driver. And I think you have, speed's not the issue. Of course, you're going to be fast. You're a Formula One driver. Uh, it's all... The, and my co-driver, Arne Hertz, had already stopped me crashing about four times before that just through remembering some muddy corner um, from some, a rally he'd done before. And he has, okay, extra caution, extra caution, slow. And you slow down and you I wonder why that is only to find like four cars down there in the, in the trees or something like that. And he was absolutely right. Um, it, it's, it's too hard a challenge, too hard. A ch- I found it easier to go and race uh, in the IROC series up against the NASCAR boys on around Talladega in Michigan. I found it more naturally. Uh, I found it a, a more natural fit than trying to do a rally. Yeah. How did you find the sort of the pace notes and making the pace notes? Because I, I, I'm sure there's some story of, of the co-driver turning to you saying, "What do you want me to write down?" Yeah, it was Roger, Roger Freeman, bless him, who, who we lost, of course, with Mark Lovell. He, I've got, I've never laughed so much as when we when we did the rally in '96. But I, I crashed the recce car, by the way, as well, because I was trying to push. Um, At least you're consistent. Kind of pu- push that along in in this ice and snow one day, trying to get the feel for it. Now, we did the fire, first three or 400 meters, and Roger said to me, of the recce, in the recce Cosworth thing. And uh, 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 he said, well, I said, well, what? He said, well, what do you want me to write? I said, well, I've got it. I thought you did this. I mean, talk about <laughs> green. <laughs> I thought he made the notes. And then trying to describe a, you know, 20 miles of forest roads, is uh, in a way that it makes any sense to when it comes back at you when you're doing 100 miles an hour through the trees is one of the hardest things I've ever tried to do. Um, no, I don't. No, that's, a, uh, that's an embarrassing moment. I'm uh, ashamed to have to share with you, yes. Um, but we, anyway, we, we, did, we, we did well. We ended up on Gwyndaf Evans' forecourt. I ended up buying the car because we needed to carry on the recce. I bought this little purple Escort 1.3 and his sales manager was like, yeah, but you're not going to take this on the recce. I'm like, no, no, we're not. Of course, we did take it. We finished the recce in this car. And um, I sent a, a van and trailer over and, and bought, bought it. And one lady owned a purple escort that we finished the recce in. I sold it on our forecourt. But Amazing. It was all right. Yeah. yeah. There's obviously, you do learn things as, as a single-seater driver or a sports car driver from rallying. I mean, Valtteri Bottas obviously does a fair bit of rallying. I think, you know, just because he loves, he loves driving. But what did you take away anything from your rallying that you then applied to sports cars or anything afterwards? Yeah, I think, yes. I think you can. Obviously, the car's always moving around. And it was always interesting when we did the race of champions at the end of the year. Nick Britton used to put on with four rally drivers versus four F1 drivers. And we had an auto test where I guess the F1 drivers tend to be slightly better for some reason. We had the rally stage where we could do a half decent job and just about keep the rally boys in sight because the stage was so unbelievably short. And then in the race, we'd leave them because, you know, they'd get to the top of Paddock Hill Bend and stick it sideways and we'd be gone. Um, although Stig was amazing, wasn't he, at, at Speed Week this year. So, um it's just a different, it's a different job, to be honest. You know, that, that ability to go through Sweet Lamb or somewhere like that in Wales, flat out in the rain first time is, is something we never have to do as racing drivers. It is. Yeah. And, then, and then Carlos took me around, as did Marco Allen once, and that t- took me around without a co-driver on a stage just to show you how to do it. So then you think, well, you haven't actually got anybody telling you where the next corner is at this point. Um, no, they're, they're in a, they're in a class one as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it, only matched by motorcycle racers in the rain, as far as I'm concerned in terms of my hero worshiping. Yeah. No, t- TT riders. Bl- blows, I don't blows even my go mind. there. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Now I, I wanted to finish on kind of a, a bit of current formula one. Um, 
we've talked about the rules, we've, we've talked about Lewis Hamilton. I wanted to talk a little bit about the kind of the next five years in terms of drivers, because it does, you know, I think we say this quite a lot, but I do think that it looks very bright. You know, there's a Verstappen, there's a Leclerc, um, George Russell, Lando Norris. There's a lot of drivers there that is cause for sort of celebration, no? Uh, absolutely, yeah. I, and uh, it's anything, that, that feeds sport, doesn't it? That comes back to my point. Ed, that everything's about tomorrow, not yesterday, it really, primarily. And yeah, I can't, I can't wait to see Verstappen and, and all these kids. And there, there'll be somebody new coming on. There'll be another Verstappen. There'll be another Lewis Hamilton pops up from somewhere. Um, you know, we, we saw Michael Schumacher pick up the mantle from it and sadly for nowhere near long enough. But, and then, you know, Fernando from Michael and then Lewis from Fernando. Fernando and you've got Seb in the middle there and, and some other great champions. So there, there will always be somebody coming over the horizon um, to, to thrill us. I, I, I don't have any concerns about that. Yeah. And, and I suppose the sort of big news is, is Alonso's return. Um, are you excited about that or are you more in the camp of, well, you know, he's been and done it and tried it and he doesn't need to come back? I am with my TV cap on. I am excited about it. Um, I do kind of feel he's had his chances and, you know, it's taking a seat. I'd like to see some young buck take. Um, but overall, I think for the sport, it, it's good. And, I, and I'm personally fasc- fascinated by it. So uh, I'm, 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 I'm pleased to see him. I mean, what a talent. Um, let's see how much speed and commitment he, he, he's got. I don't think we can ever doubt that with, with um, Fernando. I think he's a man who's kind of, Wasted his talent to an, it's a strong word. I hate to read that as a headline because I think he's he's way better than two time world champion, but I think he's ended up in too many skirmishes within his own team and, and spoiled that to, to an extent. So if he's learned from that, he'll, he'll come back and will Renault give him a championship car? Don't know, do we? Really, that's why we love live sport. We've got to tune in to find out. Yeah. So just just finishing on on yourself, you know, you're a you're a member of the Motorsport Hall of Fame now. Um, mm. And there's a question here about uh, if you could look back at your career, with both in the driver's seat and behind the microphone, is there a, is there something you look back on and think that was the most important decision I've made in my career? And also, is there something you look back on and thought, oh, slightly wish I hadn't done that? Looking back, I. I thought at the time I was working as hard as it was humanly possible and I wasn't on the physical side or maybe I had too many things going on in my, my life um, and my business life or my racing life. I wasn't as focused as a Mika Hakkinen or somebody like that. Um, And I, I didn't train as hard as Michael probably. I I tried extremely hard and I wasn't quite as good as those guys. There's nothing to do about that. So, um, Looking back, I've got a few regrets about how I did things. Um, and I've learned that by observing F1 for the last 25 years and managing DC and talking to the young drivers. So I know I made mistakes, but I think we can all say that in life. Um, things I did, I, I took my chances when they were there. And I had a lot of natural speed and, and, and I used it. I, and I could, you know, I won in touring cars I won in sports cars I won in single seaters I won in all, all sorts of things so um no I'm, I'm I'm I look back and I'm thoroughly satisfied with that did I under under perform my potential yes I did um did I do anything stupid and crazy no I didn't um I I I, I did my best I worked really hard at it and I think I I think I left with respect and uh, and that from my rival. So I've got I've got I've got no complaints. I'm as I said right at the beginning of this. I just I'm just lucky. I'm lucky I wrote that letter to Tom Walkinshaw. I'm lucky I made the best of the opportunities I had and the people I've met. And despite kicking and screaming as I went into it, I'm very lucky I started race commentary and, and my TV work. Maybe I'll have a third career in F1 yet. Who knows? But um, no, I, I've I've got a. I've got to look back and, and think um, and be satisfied. And then when you get recognized like, like, like this, and I was inducted into the FIA Hall of Fame as well, Sports Car Hall of Fame earlier on in the year. And it's those moments, and this moment, this kind of moment where you stop, you turn around and look back and think, not too bad. 
for a little country boy from from the fenlands of West Norfolk. It's um, yeah, you've got to pat yourself on the back, haven't you? Because it's too easy to torment yourself. You know, if I think about uh, crashes I had here and there that that wrecked a you know that wrecked a really good race result. I can think of two or three in Formula One that were uh, fairly central to where I might have gone next. And um, and you know, if you like Seb Vettel, Hockenheim, twenty eighteen, when he had that little off in the hairpin, you 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 say, look. I put it behind me. I'm not going to let that torment me now. Um, but I'm afraid they are, I must be like a soccer player with the, 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 the big penalty you missed or the golfer with the putt that you missed or that. Somehow you've got to park those. But I think if you're a competitive person, they're always in the back of your back of your mind and your psyche. And, and, uh, uh, most sports people like Matt, great sports people like Matt are driven by, insecurity and frustrating uh, uh, constantly driving themselves forward with lack of satisfaction in what they've achieved. Um, a few others have just had a supreme inner self-confidence like a Nigel Mansell, for example, or I met Nick Faldo and that's the thing. Um, uh, it, it's really interesting what drives sports people forward. And so, and I'm definitely in the camp of never satisfied with what I've achieved. And, and that goes, to this very day and um so you have to balance you have to balance that up so no to a, a very long answer to a relatively short question um at moments like this i look back and i feel great satisfaction and and feel very lucky yeah I d we started with murray walker i think it's probably fitting we, we finish with one of his thoughts and he he was always very touched that he was ultimately welcomed into people's living rooms on a sunday afternoon for two hours or you know as you say now five hours um it's, it's a mark of, I think, how great you are at the commentary side of it, um, off the back of your, your stellar driving career, that people love welcoming you into their living, home, living rooms around the world, not just in the UK. So congratulations on, so far, a wonderful career, and there's much more to come, and also on your Hall of Fame award. You can actually, you can use it if there's a young person coming up to actually hit them out the way with it, because it, it carries, yeah. a bit of, <laughs> carries a bit of weight. Um, and, when, and when am I going to get this? This well, that's a very good question. I'll, 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 sp I'll speak to management and see when they're going to send it. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm out of the loop at the moment on that one, but we'll, we'll get yeah. it sent over to you. But um, well, um, DHL make it up, make it up to Norfolk now. I oh, think okay. one, once, once a month. Development. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, said, congratulations again, and thank you so much, and uh, thank you everyone for for listening and watching um, to this very special Hall of Fame podcast. Uh, obviously, we're doing all these podcasts next year as well. And uh, currently looking for a sponsor. So if you're interested, uh, I sound like Martin on the forecourt at the moment, but uh, if you don't <laughs> ask, you don't get. Martin, thank you. Thank you to everyone thank listening. You. Thank you to everyone watching. We'll see you all soon. Bye-bye.